Hey everyone, uh, today I'm going to talk about simple and effective mass diffusion language models. This work was led by Subham Sahu, and the PI in the project is Volodymyr Kuleshov. So the goal of this work is to learn a language model from which we can do parallel sampling. We'd like to pull out some generation X without having to generate it one word at a time. So specifically what we're going to do is we're going to start with all blank tokens. We're going to feed these tokens into a BERT style model. That model will then fill in some of the words and then fill in some more words. And when it's done, we'll have a true sample from the underlying distribution. Several people have thought about this problem before in the past, but there are some interesting challenges involved when doing non-autoregressive generation. So in particular, we'll look at three challenges in this talk. The first is how we actually decide which words get filled in at each step. The second is how we go about training a model of this form in order to do this style of parallel sampling. And finally, we'll look at some results about whether these approaches can be made competitive with standard autoregressive models. Before I begin the talk, though, I want to give a shout out to some prior work, which goes under the name D3PF. This paper is fantastic, and if you're interested in the subject, you should definitely read it. What I'm going to describe today is a special case of some of the models explored in this paper. In particular, we're really going to focus in on one of the particular important cases that they brought up and show that this form has a nice, simple structure and that you can scale it to make it work on real problems. Okay, let's get started. So to begin with, I'm not going to assume that you have any background on how diffusion works. This talk is targeted at a general NLP audience. So before we get to text data, let's do a quick background on all you'll need to know about diffusion to understand the main ideas that we'll discuss. So we'll have a language model like object that when we sample from it gives us sign curves. Here we have a given sample X, and you can see it has a nice smooth curve structure. Instead of working with the graph, we'll instead work with a 1D heat map. Here, blue represents high values and red represents low values. Given the original curve, we can think about the idea of adding noise. This simply means taking a Gaussian around each of the points, and this gives us some weird noise version of the original curve. We can also represent this as a heat map, which is shown at the bottom of the slide. We can keep on doing this process until we end up with something that looks basically like random values. We get a heat map that alternates between blue and red values and has lost all the structure of the original signal. We can represent this process concisely in the following form. We'll have our signal X at the top of the slide. We can see that this has the nice curvature that we saw earlier, and we can represent the noise all the way at the bottom of the slide. We'll have a function Q, which is always going to go downward. The function Q adds noise to the original signal. We also have a function P theta, which goes upwards, which tries to reconstruct the signal from noise. If we want to take a sample from this distribution, we'll start with the noise at the bottom of the slide and continue to sample from P theta one step at a time until we reach a full sample X. Okay, let's break down this process into its component parts. The first step we need is to understand what going down means, specifically how we go from X to any one of the noise values in between. We can do this by simply adding noise based on how far down on the slide we currently are. We can think of subdividing this space based on a signal level alpha t. If alpha t is at one, we have the full signal. If alpha t is at zero, we just have draws from a standard Gaussian. Every point in between represents some noising to the signal itself. Here we show one value at around 0.5 that captures some of the original signal, but with additional noise. One observation is that Gaussian noise has a particularly nice structure. If we happen to have one noise value and we have access to the original signal, we can produce a posterior distribution for any value in between. This distribution also takes the form of a Gaussian. This can be shown by simply applying Bayes' rule for Gaussian distributions. We're going to use this property in order to parameterize a neural network, which we'll then use to generate. The main observation is that we could use this posterior function directly if we somehow could know the original signal x. 
Of course, on the right side, during generation, we don't actually have access to x, but we can learn some way to predict x. And once we have a prediction, we can use that to try to recover a step that is closer to the signal in this process. This requires that we learn a way to produce the original signal from any step along the denoising chain, and that we weight this by its usage in the posterior prediction. To learn this function, we'll have an objective with three parts. First, we sample a noised version of our signal. Then we weight this sample by how much we expect it to change when trying to do denoising. And then we try to reconstruct the original signal from this point. We then backprop and learn a model. Once we have this model, we can do generation by starting from noise, predicting the signal, using that prediction to take one step, and then repeating that process until we reach a final output value. Okay, so now let's talk about how we can apply a very similar process for doing discrete masking diffusion. In this stage of the talk, we're going to move from working on a continuous signal to working with words. We have a document like the one I showed earlier in the talk, but again, we're going to represent it as a 1D sequence. Note, however, that this sequence is no longer continuous, so we're going to represent it as colors and boxes instead of as a heat map. When we talk about noise, we're going to talk about masking noise. So specifically, we'll white out boxes to represent the fact that they've been masked. And of course, when talking about mass diffusion, we'll be comparing to a standard autoregressive language model. To get started, we can think about an autoregressive language model as generating by autoregressive unmasking. That is, we start with a sequence of blanks, and at each stage, we use our language model to fill in one word at a time. So we can think about this as the sampling process for standard language models, where the number of rows corresponds to the number of words. In this work, we're going to take a step towards discrete masking diffusion. Here's what our process will look like. So recall that the signal x is at the top of the slide. This is our full document. And our fully masked version at the bottom of the slide corresponds to noise. The q function represents the denoising that happens at each step and p theta represents trying to recover our original document. To do generation, we'll simply start from a full set of masks and fill in words using an unmasking process. Let's break this down in the same form as we looked at continuous diffusion. First, we need to consider our masking noise. We'll have a signal level alpha t, which represents the chance of masking at each location. Given alpha t, we simply flip a coin and mask out words with probability 1 minus alpha t. At the top of the slide, we do no masking, and at the bottom of the slide, we mask each token. Next, we consider the posterior, or unmasking, distribution. This corresponds to the probability of a word being unmasked, given that we have its later masked version, as well as the original x itself. To calculate this probability, we again apply Bayes' rule, and get a term alpha s minus alpha t over 1 minus alpha t, which represents the probability of a word being unmasked between steps t and s. This posterior distribution motivates the form of our generative process. We could produce this distribution if we had access to the true document x. However, since we're doing generation, we don't yet have access to x. We can get around this by using a neural network to take zt and predict distribution over x, and then use that distribution to try to get our unmasked step s. If we apply this process repeatedly, we can generate a sample from our distribution. So let's consider how we learn this model. Again, there's going to be three steps. We have an expectation over a weighted log probability. Step one is how we handle the expectation. We sample a time step t, and mass words with probability 1 minus alpha t. Next, we need to weight the loss by how much we expect this step to change. Specifically, we weight it by the probability of unmasking. Basically, the weight will be higher if the word is more likely to actually be unmasked in the next step, and lower if it's more likely to remain masked. Finally, we try to reconstruct the original signal. 
This corresponds to the log probability of predicting the correct word with our model. This part of the objective looks exactly like the masked language modeling objective for BERT. Finally, there is one more important detail. I've been describing everything as if we were masking for a specific number of steps. In practice, we can get rid of this detail entirely by thinking about this as a continuous time Markov chain. At a high level, what this is doing is assuming that we're taking a limit as s goes to t. This means the step size gets infinitesimally small. When we do this, we no longer have to train with a specific step size, but instead assume there is a local rate of change. This implies a weighting of alpha t prime over 1 minus alpha t, with no more mention of the s term. This weighting has a particularly nice form. If alpha t is linear, then the numerator is 1, and the denominator just corresponds to t. This means at the top of the network, we weight predictions highly, as they are more likely to lead to unmasked words. At the bottom of the network, we have more masks, but the predictions are weighted less. Okay, let's review the implementation of the model. So the first step is to sample the masks. This corresponds to choosing a masking rate somewhere between 0 and 1. This differs from BERT in that BERT uses a fixed masking rate, whereas our rate can vary in between. Next, we use this masking rate to determine our weighting. And finally, we apply a BERT architecture to try to reconstruct the gold data. That's it. Uh, that's the whole training process. To do generation, we have to actually apply this learn function p theta. To do this, at each step along the process, we take some masked version of the data. We use BERT to try to reconstruct the entire sentence. And then we randomly remask some of the predictions we've made. We never remask words that we had already predicted at the bottom of the slide. This just remasks some of the predictions we've made. Note that nowhere in this process are we doing anything smart or trying to predict certain words in a given order. I imagine future models will improve upon this point. The best way to do it remains an interesting open question. So I'll end by briefly discussing some experiments. Note for these experiments, we're primarily using an off-the-shelf BERT model. We're scaling this to real data sets and applying the techniques I've discussed previously. The experiments will primarily focus on language model likelihood. We also consider experiments that look at the use of this approach for fine-tuning on various downstream tasks. The core results are on the LM1B dataset when comparing log likelihood. We see that our model gets to a perplexity of 23 nearing the autoregressive perplexity of 20.9. We also see that on open web text, we're able to get to 23.2, nearing the autoregressive perplexity of 17.5. Specifically, the approach does better than said, a recent breakthrough in discrete diffusion that uses a different approach known as score matching. The approach also does better than various other approaches to text diffusion, which had non-competitive log likelihoods. I noted the D3PM work earlier in the talk, and we think our model is actually quite similar to their approach, but improves in perplexity mainly due to architectural and training changes. We think it's quite interesting that this simplified approach can be so effective on language model tasks. In the work, we also apply this mass diffusion language model to a domain of genomics, this is a very different task with an extremely different architecture. Again, we see improvements over other diffusion-based approaches to text generation, and the approach is nearing the likelihood of autoregressive models. One nice property of this style of parallel generation is that it can also be used for representation learning. The objective is relatively close to the standard BERT objective, and as such, it can be fine-tuned in a similar way to BERT. We find that doing so leads to significantly better glue scores than autoregressive models and is able to capture the representation learning properties of BERT while also maintaining the ability to do generative modeling. The paper also includes additional experiments looking at the generative process as well as approaches to semi-autoregressive generation. One neat thing to note as well is that when we put this paper out, 
two other concurrent works also came up with very similar formulas and similar positive results for tax diffusion. In particular, one paper, Simplified and Generalized Mass Diffusion for Discrete Data, came up with nearly the same title for the work. Highly recommend checking these papers out as well.